And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your up. one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. Coming to us straight from Lords, uh, from, ah, he's like screwed it up already. Coming from straight from the Lord, from Lords of Galapay Games, the double-headed monster behind, tra behind Trail of Heroes. In the red corner we have, we, we have Lord Luke. In the blue corner we have Lord Thomas. How are you guys doing today? Yeah, yeah. Doing just fine. <laughs> you and Thomas. Uh, oh. No Luke. No Luke. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So, I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, as is tradition around here. Oh, so, man. I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick? Oh. Okay, those humble beginnings. Yeah. All right, um, I'll start with me, and then I'll let Thomas jump in. Yep. Because his kind of branches off mine. Um, so my dad was... It, I promise this is important. My dad was, like, a gamer from, like, way back before D&D &D when it was War Games. Mm -hmm. And then D&D &D came out, and he's like, oh, that's cool. So he tried that, and he's like, oh, this is really cool. So he stuck with D&D &D for a while, and then he went to Rollmaster, and then I came around, and he introduced me to Rollmaster. I really liked Rollmaster. Um, that was around eight years old. Uh, about maybe five years later, I started DMing D&D. &D. Um I know it was somewhere in the in the introduction of third edition that I started actually playing D and D, and I played a lot of D and D in high school, and uh, that was why high school is my favorite time of my life because I had like at any given point I had like seven campaigns going actively, not just like kinda in the back burner, but like actively going. And I was playing games like three or four times a week, and it was just absolutely wonderful. I did very little homework because, or at least studying, because I didn't need to, and I wanted to play D and D. Um, and yeah, that was that was what made it stick. Really, was high school. Um, and then I will turn it over to Thomas. Uh, so I started playing in one of those seven campaigns. <laughs> Um, Andy kind of picked me out of the crowd and said, hey, you want to play? I was like, sure. <laughs> and I really stuck because high school was, well, high school. And D&D &D was not high school. So <laughs> it was my escape from the reality, as they say. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. And were you, were you guys... Pro did you guys primarily stick to D and D over those years, or did you um, experiment around with uh, with other systems? Uh, in those years, I stuck with D and D. Uh, I I wanted to go back to Rollmaster, but we were missing one of our books, and I couldn't. You know, in the days before the internet, because I'm that old. Um, <laughs> and I guess Thomas is too. He's only a year younger than me. Yep. Um, so in the days before the internet, I couldn't find Rollmaster books because they were nowhere. Um, and once the internet came around, I was like, I got 3.5, I don't really need Rollmaster. It'd be nice to go back to Rollmaster, but I don't really need it. I'm not really feeling like, you know, bidding on eBay at that eBay at that time was the only thing that I really had as an option. And I'm like, that's not worth it to me. Um, so, yeah, it was just D&D &D for me. Uh, and because of that, it was pretty much D&D &D for Thomas, too, if, if, if I know correctly. Yeah. Um, 
I know we both did Magic the Gathering, but that's not a tabletop RPG. That's just uh, another Wizards product. No, and um, I'm, I'm pretty sure sh- I'm pretty sure y- I'm pretty sure you both had to suffer through at least one person running a sliver deck. Yes. <laughs> Although I came around before slivers. Yeah, you were. I you're started. Around. I started playing Magic: The Gathering during Ice Age and Mirage. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I will admit that I'm that I'm guilty of inflicting sliver decks on people. <laughs> I yeah. was always. A, I was always a, fun. I was always a fan of wizard decks and elf decks. Oh. I liked uh, goblin decks. That was my thing. Goblin decks and burning decks. I loved red. I I would I would vent much like it much like I do with a lot of games I would I would cycle between different between different styles to keep things fresh. Um uh, it's just it's just that I seem to have I seem to have had a talent for finding for finding decks and play styles that were specifically designed to inflict mental pain. <laughs> So you would have been one of the uh, one of the oh what do they call it where they oh milling deck people mm. or or the counter spell people yes mm-hmm. I know all about you people <laughs> <laughs> well uh. putting us putting aside the fact that. Um, I've gotten the nickname the prankster prince for some of my, for some of my stunts including the time I I I tricked people into dr- into driving around in circles with free t-shirt signs. <laughs> uh. Uh, there's the it's it's funny that it's funny that you mention rollmaster given some of the stuff that I've covered like like um against the dark master which is basically a spiritual successor to Middle Earth role playing. Okay. Oh. So it's just one it's just one of those amusing bit amusing bits of coincidence. Oh. Yeah. I liked Rollmaster for the uh for the intense role playing opportunities that were built into the game. That's what I enjoyed about it. The all the math and the complicated BS was, you know, BS. But you know, I was eight years old, and my dad handled that for me. I did the role playing. I told him what I wanted to do. I rolled the dice. He said, "Okay, this is what happens." I did the math. I looked on the chart. This is what happens. I'm like, "Oh, that's cool," you know. That's why I liked Roll Master. I don't think I'd like it these days. Um. Just a little too crunchy for me," he said, knowing that he has a game out that's e- er, a game in the works that's even crunchier than Rollmaster. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, wouldn't you say uh, Thomas has never played Rollmaster? I, I can't can't say whether or not it's crunchier. <laughs> He's never played Rollmaster. He doesn't know. Nope. Uh, there are cer- there are certain games that I will that I will break out whenever some whenever someone s- says that one says that one of the bigger names is too complicated because I can sh- I know full well how deep the rabbit hole goes as it were. Yeah, it does. It really does. Um, well, Phoenix, Phoenix Command and Rifts are my whipping boys. <laughs> I. Uh... Trail of Heroes Advanced, not to brag. Mm-hmm. How many classes do we have? Counting the subclasses, Thomas? Oh, counting the subclasses. Um... By the way, subclasses are not what you think they are. Um, subclasses are... Everybody has subclasses. It's required. It, you have a main class, and then you and then you get to multi-class within the main class with subclasses. Um the subclasses are essentially classes. Main classes are categories. Uh, so the subclasses, we have like 64, 67? Yeah. Something like that. And you get points to spend within your main class, and then you get points to spend within your subclass, 
you get an individuality number within your main class and subclass, which means you get to take away points from what you start with and add to something else. Um, some subclasses roll for how much individuality points they have. Some main classes roll. Some don't. It, 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 it's crazy. And then there's the spells. <laughs> My God, the spells. Um, yeah, I'm those, not even going to go there. Yeah, those, those can get complicated fast. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm not even working on the spells at the moment because they were giving me a headache. <laughs> Uh, so speaking speaking of that, with Trail of Heroes, was it a was it a case much much like the creation of Rollmaster, where it was a collection of where you guys were just house ruling what you had until it became its own thing? Uh, Trail of Heroes. All right. First of all, let's make a distinction because the viewers are not going to know this. There's three categories of Trail of Heroes. There's Trail of Heroes Basic, Trail of Heroes Standard, and Trail of Heroes Advanced. I'm working on Basic and Advanced. They're not out yet. Except to certain people. Like, our, uh, our highest Patreon backers get all of our stuff as soon as it's playtestable, which includes Basic and Advanced. Anyway. Or at least Basic. Um, standard was the first thing that I came up with, and I was working on, standard came out as a idea of, um, honestly, I was already kind of thinking through a, some sort of system in my head, but it was really, really simple and stupid and horrible. Um, and then my math teacher in sixth grade, this is sixth grade. This is way before Thomas and I met. Yep. My math teacher said, hey, you need to, everyone here needs to make a game. I don't care what it is. Just make a game. It has to include math. That means numbers. That means colors. That means patterns. That means anything. I don't care. I'm like, okay, I'm going to make a tabletop RPG in three weeks. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, uh. And that lasted until 2013 when it first got published. At that point, it was... Uh, what was it? Heroes what of Galope. Yeah, Heroes of Galope. And at that point, it was Heroes of Galope 1.0. Trail of Heroes Basic or Trail of Heroes Advanced did not exist. Neither did Heroes of Galope Basic or Advanced, because they came out around before Trail of Heroes. Um, and then we rebranded as Trail of Heroes because people were confusing Heroes of Galope with Lords of Galope, because at that point, I finally had my own company, um, and Thomas was part of it. Um, and yeah, it just... It just expanded from there. I'm like, hey, I finished the game. I got to start something new. Crap. Got to start over. Um, <laughs> and, and continue working on the game I already had. Because I recognized that just because you finish a game doesn't mean it's finished. Mm -hmm. It just means you got to work on it more. Um, and now, uh, just so you know... One thing we are very proud of, in a way, is that we only sell digital copies. And the reason we do that, and this is why we're proud of it, is because we continuously update on a real-time basis. And people who get the digital copy get... Instead of a PDF, they get an access to a Google, Google Docs folder. And in that folder are all the real-time updates. Mm -hmm. So you're never going to have to buy a new edition of Trail of Heroes unless you're looking for Trail of Heroes Advanced and you're not willing to pay a monthly fee on Patreon. Which, by the way, $10 a month is ridiculously low for all the games that we will ever make. Um, 
but it that that is what we do that is different from D and D or Pathfinder or whatever. There's never going to be a Trail of Heroes two e where you have to buy a new game and you know rebuy all your books and shit like that. Um, also, uh, all the, unlike D&D, although Pathfinder, I understand, is like this. I came before Pathfinder, though. <laughs> um, so this was me before Pathfinder. Um, unlike D&D, we have all our core rule books in one book. There's other books out there. But they're not the core rule books. You absolutely do not need them. And I have gone like 10, 12, 13 something years like that just playing the core rule books and still get surprised with people figuring out things like, oh, I'm going to make this new build that's surprisingly effective from the core rule books. I'm like, wait, what? That, that, what? You, you, you're going to do what? What? And, um, so it's, it's a great game if you're looking for something that is like, you know, shameless plug. Mm-hmm. And with the, with that kind of thing in mind, I've always t- I've talked in a lot of in a lot of my previous interviews and work. You know, a, complete a, replayability to play. Oh, sorry. Sorry about Go ahead. sorry about sorry about that. There was a bit there was a bit of a delay. I didn't I didn't know if you were finished, but um, I've talked about a all roads lead to Rome kind of kind of thing within design of tabletop games, because in in the very early days, when the, when pe- when there was still a lot more of the DNA of the wargaming scene, you had mm-hmm. a whole lot of sub mechanics. But mm-hmm. as time has gone on, there's been a there's been a mindset of all roads lead to Rome, as I as I call it, because in something like say D and D, ninety percent of your rolling is gonna be is gonna be using that D twenty. Yes. Um, in something like World of Darkness, no matter what, no matter what, you're rolling a pool of d10s. Okay. Um, in Rollmaster, you are rolling a d100. Um. What what would be what would be that central that central resolution in Trail of Heroes? Depends on basic or standard. Basic is a very all ro- roads lead to Rome type thing. Um, it is D percentile and D twenties, and that's all you need. Mm-hmm. Um, and standard, excuse me, in standard, uh, you need a lot of everything. Really, I mean, you're gonna need a lot of D hundreds. Well, not a lot of D-100s. You're going to need some D-100s um, for a lot of stuff. That It is a central... I describe it as centrally a D-percentile system. I do. But in reality, it's not. Because there's so many D-20s, D-10s, D-12s, D-6s, D-8s, D-4s, D-3s, D-2s. There's everything. Um, so... Eh, not always all roads lead to Rome <laughs> in that game specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, since you mentioned you mentioned cl- you mentioned classes and subclasses, would it be fair would it be fair of me to say that classes in this system are more akin to a broad archetype? No. Um, well, Thomas, what, what would you say? 
as far as classes? <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, the broad part might apply. Mm. Might make it apply. What would you say? I don't know. They're, they're pretty specific path-wise. Um, Are they? Yeah. Like I, fighter? Yeah, well, so in that, in that respect, I was thinking more like archer and mage and that kind of thing, but... Yeah, I yeah. mean, like, fighter can... The reason I say you can take all these different builds, that like, like on our Patreon, we have uh, one of the free things we do... Every every week we put out four different um, four different character ideas with different builds and different archetypes and different things described on them and what they're good at. So like a mage can be a thousand different archetypes. Yes. Like you can have um, a generalist mage. You can have a firebolt mage. You can have a fireball mage. You can have a ice bolt mage. You can have an ice blast mage. You can have a shocking bolts mage you can have a lightning bolt mage you can have it you know any spell in the game you can specialize in and they all do different things for you uh it's not just a oh i like this spell so i'm going to keep with this spell it's a different archetype altogether and there's hundreds of them fighter is slightly more less general yeah you know it, it's slightly less broad y you can have a defense fighter a armor fighter a armor and defense fighter a armor damage fighter a defense damage fighter a damage fighter a health fighter a health and damage fighter a any more yes yeah a <laughs> tripping fighter a pushing <laughs> fighter you know it goes on um, archers can be thieves, they can be bowmen, they can be uh, crossbowmen throwing daggers, and again, all of these are different archetypes. Uh, they're not just different specialties, they're actually different archetypes. Um, and that is what makes it such a unique system, is you just got so many archetypes. And that's why the... And that's why I said... Maybe with broad because they're all related, mm -hmm. but they're not really even one archetype. Oh, so that that's why I was a little confused as to how to answer well, that question. What I mean, but what I mean by what I mean by that in terms in terms of in terms of archetypes is the is the range is the range of applications because right. I, because I was, because, well, the, I guess the, I guess the best way to, I guess the best way to put it is two things. One, are you, you, are you guys utilizing a leveling system or is it a free form XP is currency approach? Uh, leveling. All right. That, the other half of that is, what is, um. Since it since it's multi classing, is it a case where when you where where when you level up, you'd have to choose which between your class or your subclass, which one you advance, or are they advancing parallel with each other? Uh in advanced, they're both advancing at the same time. In standard, there is no st there is no subclass in main class. That's uh, I, I was. Okay, that that I was getting confused. Yeah. Um, yes, subclasses in advanced are definitely archetypes. Definitely, uh, main classes would be very broad archetypes. That's kind. That's kind of where it was where it was trying to lean towards the broad versus specific kind of thing. Yeah, and and I got confused as to which I I edition you were talking about. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Now, with that with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, when it come when I'd I'd saw that the that um 
a roll of 95 or above is consi is considered a vital hit. So I'm I'm curious is 95 or higher your your guys's version of criticals in general yes. or is it specific t or is it a combat specific affair? It is it is uh, a critical um it <sighs> You know, I mean, it's up to the GM, sort of like in D&D 5th edition, where everyone's got that argument of, you know, rule of cool versus skills can't have a critical hit or whatever, you know, type of thing. But So, yes, it is technically combat specific, but a lot of times I'll allow a vital hit to be a non-combat thing. And no, it is not apply to spells, except in very specific sp cases. Um, and then there's the thing of different weapons will change that. Um, for example, a scimitar, I believe, is 85 to 100, right, Thomas? Yeah. And then a... Uh, there's, there, there's a couple that are like, instead of 95 they're like 97 to 100 but they have massive damage or they have a massive uh vital damage mul multiplier um so it it gets weird mm -hmm. as you can tell i give long answers <laughs> i give long questions <laughs> uh so now, give, given given that, um, how are you guys? Are you guys? Are you guys utilizing a a skill based a skill based approach? Where, I, I guess the best, I guess the better way to put, actually, no, no, I take I take that back because you did you did say that you were doing, um, a degree a degree of subsystems. And from what from what I've seen with some, with some of the example sheets, um, you have sets of se of separate abilities, um, sta standard abilities, thieving abilities, and and so on. Is that the is is that something that's consistent with both basic and advanced? Yes. Yeah. The only the only one that doesn't have that is basic. Basic is uh, completely no, different. No, 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 no. Basic has thieving abilities. It does That's not right. have random abilities. Correct. You get a set... You get set additions based on what you choose path-wise. Right. And, um... If... Yeah, uh... So... All three of them have... Standard abilities and thieving abilities, depending on your class. For example, a fighter will only get spot and listen from the thieving abilities and only from his race or her race. Mm -hmm. um, however, an archer will get the full array. An all hand will get some of them. Um... You know, it, it, it varies. I, I, I think those are the only classes that actually get thieving abilities. Am I right? Oh, no, no, no. Bard. We added yep. Bard. Yep. Now, what would... Now, shifting the classes for a bit, given given that ability design, um, what sort what would you end up get what would you end up getting from leveling up? Is it a case where you'd get speci where you'd get um specific benefits? Or is it a case where you'd get a set of points for different that you could spend on different ability types? You want to answer that, Thomas? You have yeah, I, I I got that. Um, so it's it's different based on the game. So basic, you get a set amount based on fighting style. So like, if you want berserker, say you get plus thirty five health, and then you get to add that benefit in to your character sheet. Um, for standard, though, you get a set of points, and you can spend um, those points anywhere you want based on what you're trying to achieve. And you can spend up to a certain amount, as described in the the in in the rule book. And then, and, 
and each each uh, ability, each standard ability or thieving ability has a, has a maximum amount that you can spend in that ability per level as well. Correct. And then the same in advanced. That's just the way the advanced handles it as well. Yeah. For advanced, so it adds an extra layer of spending it both in main classes and in subclasses. Correct. Yeah, I've I've seen some I've seen some cases. Have the have the rate of increase to expend increase to expenditure um, ch change between okay. between abilities, but I'm guessing okay. in your case the the deciding factor is what is what you, is the maximum cap that you can spend on certain abilities. So it's a little bit of both. So for example, health in standard. It, I'll just talk about standard for now because it gets complicated and I don't know all the details about all the other ones. I haven't memorized them. Um, so in standard, let's say you're spending in health, you're, you want to spend the maximum points in health. Uh, one point le allows you to increase your health by 10, a maximum of two points spent for a total of 20 health per level. However, armor allows you to spend one point per one up to a maximum of three, giving you three ma armor per level as a maximum. And obviously you're, you're not going to get enough points to spend in everything you want, thus giving you specializations and the ability to customize your character further. Because otherwise, you know, if, if you got everything, then everybody would be the same. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and then you can specialize in attack if you're a certain type of character class. You, you And it gets more complicated than that. Yeah. You get to specialize based on the needs of the party. Mm -hmm. Right. Now... In so, in a lot of cases, I've have seen I've seen diff I've seen different um different da different damage types when it comes to when it comes to weapons and mm -hmm. how and how that interacts with armor. Do you get are you guys doing a similar approach to that, or are you using a more universal approach to armor? Um. Okay, so that's that's a little weird. <laughs> um. First of all, I'd like to differentiate armor from defense. Mm -hmm. Armor is damage reduction in D&D. &D, defense is AC. Let's just get that out of the way because that's going to confuse people. Um, so, yes, there are monsters that are resistant to certain types of weapons. Um, however, it is not a bludgeoning, piercing, slashing, is it? Wait, no, no, in the, in the, uh, in the new arms and armory rules, I have added those. Um, but, just to make it simpler, um, but in the original rules, and, you know, Still, optionally, the rules that you follow. Um, the arms and armory rules are an extra book, so you don't have to use them. Um, in those rules, it's more of like a, you know, you describe the type of weapon that the skeleton is resistant to. So the skeleton is resistant to edged weapons, including bows and spears, but not axes. Because of the arc of how it's used and all that stuff. Um, and then there's, you know, zombies are resistant to blunt weapons. Uh, and, and then that makes axes like the superpower weapon because they do high damage. They have a high crit rate or, or high crit damage and they're effective against zombies and skeletons. But there's also negatives to them. So now, in in combat, what would the effects of a critical be? Because the way you guys have set it up, I I can't help but doubt that it would be um 
just additional damage. It is. Oh, it is. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it you is. Get, uh, you um, get additional, additional damage based on the weapon. Yeah. So like a long sword. Um, depending on the rule book you're listening to, it's either roll twice for damage or multiply it by two. Um, an, like, I think a bearded axe is like 375% damage mm -hmm. in, in the, uh, in the arms and armory rule book. However, there's a two handed axe and that's, that's as fancy as the axes get in the regular rules. And that is, is it 300 or 400% damage? Or, no, okay. three, three or four times roll. I think, I think it's four times. Okay, you roll four times for axe for two-handed axe with uh, a vital. So it's it's you know it's a significant amount of more damage, and the the other thing about it is um, you cannot dodge, and vitals are an automatic hit. Um. And then there's the thing of you only get to subtract your armor once. So instead of, you know, even if you're rolling twice, let's say you roll the damage twice, you don't subtract the armor from each roll. You subtract the armor once, because otherwise it's just, you know, going to be way less damage. Mm -hmm. And I wanted my damage, my, uh, arm, my, uh, vitals to be insanely effective. Now, with that, with that in mind, I want to talk about spellcasting for a bit. Because if I'm not mistaken, you guys do ha you guys do have the con the concept of spells per day and spells known. Mm -hmm. Um what I'm curious about is if um, spells are fire and forget, or if, or if um, players will have a way to customize spells. Oh, you can customize. You can customize the living daylights out of it. Oh, there's so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, like buffer based spells, you can ca you can customize how. Not only can you upgrade a spell that you decide to upgrade, but you can upgrade it in different ways. A summoning based spell. Let's say you want to summon. Let, let's say you want to specialize in summoning rats. Mm -hmm. You can end up with rats with five hundred health each, or you can end up with rats doing an average of hundred fifty damage each. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, obviously at high level, but like I had one character, I had to nerf his items because his items way, made his rats way more powerful. But um, I had one character who killed the big bad in one round with his freaking first level some rat spell. <laughs> I was not expecting that. Uh... But you know, stuff like that happens in in these games. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, then there, was your, there, there was your 72d6 fireball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Firebolt starts at 66 plus six is it something around there yeah and then there's a little tiny bit of after the you know the next round damage from a burning sensation mm -hmm. um yeah burning sensation you're on fire um <laughs> so uh yeah my my firebolt ended up being an initial damage of 76 d6 damage which was more damage to a single target than my fireball was. <laughs> but, uh, you know, obviously the fireball did more damage to overall to other targets. Mm -hmm. But, um, and, and fireball starts with 1d20 per level. So, and it doesn't have a map. Except, does it max out at sixteen when you finish when you finish your regular levels, Thomas? 
I don't know. I haven't played any legendary characters yet. Okay. I think I think all all spells like that max out at legendary level, which is sixteen which is starts with seventeenth. So it would max out at sixteen D six. Or no, sixteen D twenty. But then you get to specialize in it, adding D sixes to it. And you can do that in massive quantities, as I have already proven with my 76 D6, or 72 D6, or whatever it was. Yeah, it was 76 D6, Firebolt. Mm -hmm. um, it, I mean, he was 16th level at that point, so he was pretty much legendary level, pretty much. He was maximum normal level, and that was as far as we could take the campaign at the moment. Because we didn't have legendary level rules yet. But, you know, still, that's a lot of D6s. I didn't have that many D6s. And I, well, I do now. But I didn't at the moment. <laughs> I have about a thousand dice now. So I'm definitely a dice goblin. That's still not enough. No, it's not. It's not. It's just I don't have the money to spend on them. <laughs> uh. Now, since you mentioned legendary levels, I'm guessing I'm guessing that there is a cap, that there's a cap for regular levels. Yes, sixteenth. And um, so go ahead. Is I'm get and what what would be the what would be the defining difference between regular levels and legendary? That's a good question. Um. <laughs> You get to spend more points. There's le uh, uh, there's a higher cap. The points are worth more. Uh, you get new spells with spellcasters. You get new, more powerful spells that work a different way completely. You buy them, and you buy them per cast. So, like, you can't just cast them per day anymore. You buy them, and... I think you might even be able to buy them with points to increase their power even more. And then you cast them once, and then you got to buy them again. Mm -hmm. So you want to preserve those spells <laughs> until you really need to. Uh, it's not like, Meteor Swarm! Just because I feel like it, you know? I know that's not an epic level spell in D&D, but it damn well better be. It should be, but, um, anyway, uh, like, oh, there's a spell that allows you to use every special venom and poison in the game all at once to one person. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, oh, no, no, it's one, not one person. It's a cloud of it over a large area. And they keep, they keep making the save until the cloud goes away, they get out, or they fail the save. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's all sorts of really powerful spells that you just have to buy once and then use and then buy again. And it, it just... it's I, I think it's worth it. We haven't really done that much legendary level testing, though. Because the legendary, le the legendary book came out at the same time as or it was finished at the same time as the um as as the as the other one came out and it came out at the same time as well um so it's it was the first extra book to come out and it is the least tested extra book, just because I have trouble getting people to that level. Mm -hmm. It's hard to run a campaign that long. Yeah. And... And then jumping them to 16th level from the beginning is difficult to do. It's difficult to, you know, calculate how much treasure, how much potions, how much, you know, magical items they should have. Now, with that with that in mind, when it comes, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, 
you guys are not doing a, a thing. You guys are not doing the whole thing of spells hitting automatically. No, you st you still have to roll for them. Yes, with most spells. Mm -hmm. Yes. The like the exceptions would be, let's say you're technically targeting the square in front of you. Your square or a friendly target after combat. If you're targeting a friendly target during combat, you still have to roll to hit. You just usually, usually, keyword, only need to not fumble. Mm -hmm. uh, if you roll a zero, or, or, yeah, a zero. If you roll a zero on a D100, that's possible, right? If you roll a <laughs> one to a 10 on the D100, you fumble. That's with any attack, mm -hmm. ever, period, across the board. Unless there's, like, some special magic item that the DM makes up. But, um... Yes, you have to roll for most attacks. Or, for most spells. And it's casting accuracy for spells. Ranged for, like, bows and crossbows and thrown weapons. And then attack for melee weapons. Given the given the given the level of dice that are get, that are getting thrown around, it would would you say that Trail of Heroes is is a game that is gonna lean more into higher degrees of lethality? That depends on the GM, I think, because I haven't really killed that many characters. You haven't. I you killed haven't a couple. A, you haven't had a TPK. Uh, Thomas insists that the first game I played with him, I TPK'd him. But that was... Not only was that D&D, &D, that yeah. never happened. <laughs> he uh, is wrong. <laughs> he must be remembering something from when he was in the Navy, or I don't know. But that never <laughs> happened with me. I have uh, never TPK'd a, a, a party, except for one instance... We weren't playing a proper role-playing game. It was just something at recess in, like, first grade, and I hated the person, and he deserved it. He really did. All the people that knew him go, yep, he deserved it. I don't even need to know the story. Um, and um, so I godly blasted, a, godly blasted, fired him. Mm -hmm. Now... One question that I often ask whenever it whenever it comes to whenever it comes to get whenever it comes to games that have some sort of archetype system or or class or what have you can you gish <laughs> gish gish is jeez I'm, I'm really dating my, I'm really dating myself with some of the origins of the uh, of these terms um <laughs> A gish, it a gish is short is shorthand for any any sort of character build that is decent in bo in both physical fighting and casting. Yes, all hands, bards, warlocks, uh, some priests, um, some druids, um. Anything else, Thomas, that you can think of? Oh, Inquisitors? Yep, I was about to say that. Paladins? Yep. Obviously. I mean, that's kind of what they are. Um, even, even archers can get spells. Nope, all hands, not archers. Oh, what? I'm, yeah, I'm thinking of something else. <laughs> and just from the name alone, I'm assuming all hands is your jack of all trades setup. Yes, yes, yeah. and you would be surprised the amount of people who don't get it. <laughs> you would also be surprised the amount of people who look at the name of the deity that I really need to rename, all or no, and go, "Hmm, a Lorno? Who's that?" <laughs> all or no, <sighs> naming a deity all or no? That's a very Pratchett thing to do. I know. I'm Remember, I started this when I was in sixth grade. <laughs> I need to read it. 
I'm, I'm not calling, I'm not calling there's you out. A few for, names. I'm not there's calling a few you out for that. Out there. I'm not calling you out for that. I'm act, that's actually a compliment. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't like the name. <laughs> okay, well that's a di- that's a different matter entirely. Yeah. <laughs> uh. But um yeah, I uh yeah, th- there's a few names in there that I have to redo. Um one of them would be Inferno. One of them would be All or No. I I think I kind of like Many Leg with the backstory of Many Leg. Um can can you think of any Thomas that I really need to redo? Not not counting the one the vampire that Drew renamed that we are not going to speak of. <laughs> no, that I was just trying to think of things that were in the book, but no, I Jackson Jaquatux just for the lack of being able to pronounce it, probably. Yeah. <laughs> That was yeah. one of those you type random letters into the keyboard and you're like, oh, that looks cool for a dragon. <laughs> now no one can pronounce her name. Good. Uh, yeah, so cool thing about dragons, since we're on the to- topic. Um, dragons, there's like five of them that exist, period, at this point in the game. At the, his- at the point where the game generally takes place um and they're all basically godlike in fact most of them are worshipped as gods and grant deity powers mm-hmm. which all deities grant deity powers to all characters just depends on what class you are that what you get Now, with that with that kind of thing in mind, I know that the standard version is st- is still in be- is still in beta. But what are you shooting for as far as its total page count? Okay, standard version is in beta because we're working on the grammar edits. Mm-hmm. That that's our beta. Yeah. <laughs> um. Fair. So, um. The, the page count, also we have to add some artwork to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the page count that we're looking for is, let's see, it, right now it's somewhere between like 230 and 270. I don't remember exactly what the number is, but we're shooting towards somewhere around 275. Even with the artwork. And that's the stand that that's the main rule book. Um, like I said, you you only need the main rule book, um, but there are other rule books. Uh, the character options rule book is like a hundred thirty, hundred thirty five pages, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the biggest other rule book. I, and I I can get behind that. Oh, and I'm get I'm guessing I'm guessing that once you guys finish with the with the grammar edits and art additions to the standard, you're going to be you're going to be spending more time on the advanced version. I'm going to be spending more time. On, I'm going to be focus focusing first on basic, and then I'm going to get to advanced. Yeah. Um. We've been getting a lot of requests for a less crunchy version of our game to get used to it. So, yeah. So, basic would be really nice to have out. Um, even, you know, to the people that are not just playtesting it. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, if you want to playtest, reach out to us. We need playtesters. Yes. <laughs> just. Also, we need people to run a playtest because I can't do it all. Mm-hmm. Oh. You can't do everything in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but with all that, with all that said, I do want to th- sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the 
madness around here? Absolutely, it was fun. Uh, pleasure is all ours. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As okay. I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. See, Thomas, <laughs> I told you it was your turn. Yep. <laughs> but, uh, uh, we may actually take you up on that after we get some more milestones under our belt. So, anyway. Yep. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come up, to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody!